up here in Morse Grips. Let's just see for laughs what this is. Porkchop Hill. Oh, this is really cool. It was the first good part that I got when I got out of the Army. Uh, Porkchop Hill. Lynn Stallmaster was a big fan of mine. And Porkchop Hill. I had a good part in it. And uh, they left me in it. Poor Shawville, that was a good, a lucky break. Now this, to me, is a big deal. This movie was called Pork Chop Hill. Gregory Peck actually hired me. He was a very conscientious guy when it came to work. He was in the room when the actors were reading for the parts and I read for a part. This is interesting because Porkchop Hill is a true story. And you can see that they even put the map in of Porkchop Hill and the specifics of how they were gonna take the hill. The first squad, the second squad, the third squad's gonna come up here and the fourth squad. So if you see the movie, you know that it's true because this was the actual hill that they, we, we shot it out in the valley, but I mean, they, they really stuck to the true story of Pork, Pork Chop Hill. And here's the hill itself, and that's how you got to the hill. These are different names of different hills that were, this was all true story of Pork Chop Hill. These are the King Company, 1st Platoon, 2nd Platoon, 3rd Platoon, Easy Company, Love Company, George Company. This was all the real deal. They stuck to the real story with the real people, except for the Army guys were all actors. Anyway, Porkchop Hill was very important to me because I got the job because I had just gotten out of the Army and there were some stunt scenes in it that they were talking about saying this is going to be hard to find stunt guys because only in the army can you learn how to throw yourself down on concertina wire and have people run over your back and when i was in the infantry they taught us how to lay down and how to protect the side of your face so that you could lay on the concertina is barbed wire that's in a circle. If the barbed wire is straight, it's easier to knock it down. But concertina wire, you have to fall and then the next guy has to run over you and fall a little further. And the third guy runs over you and falls down. And then you have a human bridge that people can run over the barbed wire. So people that I had worked for, because I started working in 1936 or 38 on the Little Rascals and all that stuff. But when I got out of the army, a lot of the jobs that I did had stunts involved with them. And they found out that I had been in the infantry. So I got in there and then they said, you might just as well read for us and Gregory Pecky, I said, yeah, let him read for the part of so-and-so. And I got hired right then and there because, and this is the original script. See all the different color pages? Those are all rewrites. This script was originally all white pages, but they, every time they rewrite, they change the color. So it's easier for you to get in and get out. And so Porkchop Hill was a very important film for me to get started back in show business. In weeks of basic, you learn everything there is to learn about the infantry. You learn what to do with a, with a tank and how to get under it. I was an actor when I was five years old. I did five years on The Little Rascals. 
I worked in dozens of movies. I was under contract to MGM. Through my teenage years, I worked as an actor, and then I was drafted. And I was drafted into the infantry because Korea was still going on. And we had 16 weeks of basic. Most of the time you have eight weeks. We had 16 weeks of basic because there were too many people getting killed in Korea because they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't good enough soldiers. So we had 16 weeks of basic here in California. Now, I never had to be a stuntman. I did a lot of stunts. I mean, in the Little Rascals, we used to get hurt a lot, especially the littlest one, which was me, because there were no people small enough to double me. So I had to do a lot of stuff that scared the hell out of me. I mean, I can show you stuff that I did in the Little Rascals. I mean, it was really scary and nobody told me how to do it because nobody had ever done it before. I mean, I was actually on a little platform with four skates, one in each corner that me and Buckwheat made and we put it out in the street and when a car came by, we hooked onto the back of the car, except that nobody told us what to do when we hooked onto the back of the car. What we had to figure out to do is to lock our arms so that when the car slowed down, you didn't slide under it and get your brains kicked in. So we did a lot of um, farm hands, in, in farm hands, farm hands, Two people, Froggy got hurt really bad, but we, we got hurt a lot because there were no little people small enough to double us that, you know, because we were not only little, but we were skinny. So we learned how to do a lot of stuff. When I got out of the army, I was taking whatever I could get. And everybody I knew that I worked a lot of horses because of all my years at Republic with uh, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, doing the Red Rider Little Beaver stuff. I learned a lot about horses. I learned how to fall off a horse. I learned how to do this. I learned how to do that. I learned how to jump off of my horse onto the other guy's horse and both of us fall down. But you better fall in the right place where they got the ground soft because if you miss your mark, the ground's hard and it hurts. But if there's enough Jack Daniels around, you get by with it. So when Porkchop Hill came along, everybody knew that it was full of stunts. And the stunt coordinator, I forget his name, he's dead now, knew that I had just gotten out of the army. So I got hired for the whole movie to show up every day, suit up in infantry clothes, and then do whatever I was supposed to do. I doubled a lot of different people. I, if, I, if I show you the movie, I'll show you where you think you're looking at Norman Fell. You're not looking at Norman Fell. You're looking at me acting like Norman Fell because I was doubling, I was doing all kinds of junk that I knew how to do from the infantry. There's uh, ways to handle uh, explosives. There's ways to do all kinds of things. Anyway, that's how I worked my way in. And then Gregory Peck, maybe he knew me from before. Maybe he knew me from the Little Rascals or something. When I went in there for the interview, he said, uh, have him read for Ely. I got some great pictures from Porkchop Hill. Eventually I'll find them and you'll see them if you're tuned to whatever the hell you're tuned to you'll find out and uh, you'll see the pictures that I have from Porkchop Hill, the one where uh, I, uh, my, my arm got blown up and I, uh, from, from, from not, uh, from throwing the grenade and I was supposed to throw it into a machine gun hole and I missed the hole and the grenade supposedly bounced back and blow my arm up. And uh, 
It was a good experience for me, and it turned out to be a good piece of film that I got other jobs with. Gregory Peck was a nice guy. I liked the way he treated his family on the set. He was a gentle soul. He really was a sweetie. It's funny. Just one story for about Gregory Peck. The best performance he ever gave, I think, was as Captain Ahab in Moby Dick. And he didn't want to have anything to do with the movie. He had he he couldn't figure out how he could possibly play Ahab. But John Houston couldn't get backing for the movie unless he had a star to play Ahab. I mean a bankable movie star, not a, not a good actor, but a bankable movie star to get the people in the theater. Houston wasn't worried that he was going to make a bad film. He just had to be able to get the people in the theater. So he went to his friend Gregory Peck and said, Greg, will you do me a favor? Do this movie for me. And Gregory Peck said, I can't play Ahab. I'll never pull it off. In a million years, I'll never pull off Ahab. I would be happy to do it for you, but it'll be a terrible movie. He says it'll be the best performance you ever gave. And if you look at that movie, and you see Gregory Peck, who in Porkchop Hill was a straight ahead hero. And in most of his films, he played a good guy, a heroic guy, a straight ahead guy. And the two performances that I think are the best he ever gave, he played bad guys. In one of his first starring roles when he was just a kid, Duel in the Sun, he played a bad guy, and he was brilliant. It's still my favorite Western. I'll put it up against Shane. I'll put it up against anything. Duel in the Sun is just a, a magnificent movie. Anyway, his Captain Ahab was great. Ahab. Well, who is Ahab? Why Ahab be Ahab? He tied a bullet in the devil in the devil's tail and turned the jaws of hell into a rocking chair. That's who Ahab be. Uh, those are just some of the characters that talk about Ahab. Because never no in the movie, Ahab was always not seen very much. He was always in his quarters. And he said, I don't sleep, I die every night. Those are not sheets, those are shrouds, and they cover a dead man. That's who Ahab is. Anyway, he was brilliant in the movie. And for the rest of his life, he thanked John Huston for giving him the part. Very difficult movie to make because in those days they didn't have all the effects that they have now. They can make a minnow look like a whale. But in that movie, they had to build an actual whale with about 20 different motors in it. So some guy's pushing buttons and the different motors are doing different things to the whale. And when Ahab gets caught in the rope when he's trying to kill Moby Dick he gets caught in the rope and he goes down and when he comes up his hand is flopping and the crew members on the boats say Ahab he's dead but he beckons and he goes under again and when he comes up, he's going like that. Now, how did Gregory Peck do that? 
I mean, he had to hold his breath when he was down there. And came up and did that, and he was tied. He was tied to that machine. He was tied to it, he couldn't get loose. But he did what he had to do, and that's what you do. Now I know that none of it has to do with any of the scripts, and you, my staff, are going to have to say, well, what the hell do I do with all this Porkchop Hill and Ahab stuff? I suggest you put it out there, because if the people look at it and they're not interested in it, all they got to do is push a button and go watch Mary Tyler Moore. It ain't costing them nothing to learn about Ahab. It ain't costing them nothing to learn about Duel in the Sun. So don't worry about it. If it's long and you say, gee, what am I going to do with all this? How does it relate to Naked City? It doesn't have to relate to anything. This is free. I'm talking, and it, they're not, they're, they're, there's no box office here where they have to put a quarter in to find out why Struther was singing, oh, do you remember from Betsy from Pike, who crossed the high mountains with her, her brother I? Anyway, I figure if there's movie fans out there who live in Des Moines or who live in Augusta, Georgia, they like to hear about the movies. And because I'm 87 years old and I've been in the movies, well, since the 30s, I can tell you stories about everybody, you know. Natalie Wood, my best friend. I can tell you stories about Elizabeth Taylor that nobody else knows. We were close friends, dear close friends. I think I've said this before. She loved Edgar Allan Poe, and I couldn't read. So Miss McDonald would send us out on the porch, and she would read Edgar Allan Poe out loud and I would memorize it. Of course, my ears work perfect, but my eyes and my mouth are all messed up from my head and concussions and stuff like that. But I can remember. So I would remember, and then I would do Edgar Allan Poe back to her, and she would sit and listen to it. And then knocking at the door, tis the wind and nothing more. Uh, and 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 the raven no tis the raven and the raven sitting evermore shall I waste evermore it was a dark windy night and the moon was shining bright and the stars was like I can if I work on it I can probably remember the whole poem because somewhere in my brain there's a lot of doors that I can open and remember stuff but. Uh, that's all you get for now, because the lady who's holding the camera looks like she's going to fall over. <laughs> I'll see you later, gang. God bless you. I'm glad you're out there, and I'm glad you're listening. And if you sit down at the dinner table and talk about that nut Robert Blake, I'll have a few laughs. That's uh, Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to be remembered as the guy who made him laugh on camera, telling crazy stories about Gregory Peck. Ahab beckons. He beckons. He beckons. If you'll notice, in all of Gregory Peck's career, they had to be careful about his limp because he had a limp from the first movie that he starred in, which was Duel in the Sun and the horse fell, and Gregory Peck didn't know in those days, you know, the first thing you do when the horse has fallen is get your leg out of the stirrup and get away so the, the stirrup doesn't, but the horse fell on his knee and crushed it. Didn't break it, it crushed it. And if you look at his movies, uh, I'm gonna watch one of his movies right now, Yellow Sky.
you'll see him limping through the whole movie and they had to readjust the camera to take the limp out because 90% of the movie was running and stuff like that. Anyway, I'm through for now, if you are. And uh, if you don't hear from me, uh, I got shot by a young, jealous lover and caught me with his wife and shot me. See you later. Uh, I forgot to tell you, and I don't know where my crew is going to stick it in, but uh, I did 16 weeks of basic infantry because there were too many people being killed over there that had eight weeks and didn't know what the hell they were doing. So they were really training people to go to Korea. But while we were in Korea, what was the name of the place? Panmun Jam was where they were negotiating uh, a North and a South Korea to stop the war. And the Panmun Jam thing went on and on and on. So they said the war is going to go on and on. So we have to send some guys over there that are good soldiers. So instead of eight weeks of basic, I went through 16 weeks and they cut my orders. I was going to, supposed to go home for two weeks and then get on the boat and go to Korea. And while I was home, they declared peace in Panmunjom. So they canceled my orders to Korea, where I would have probably been, been killed, and they sent me to Alaska. So I mean, I don't want some people out there in the Great Lakes saying, he didn't go to Korea. I mean, look on the wall, you can see he didn't go to Korea. There's, none, there's no Michael James Gubitosi in Korea. That's because I went to Alaska. And uh, I know Korea would have been awful, but Alaska was no fun for me. And God is still looking over my shoulder. I mean, I'm an old man. I ain't going to be around for a long time. There's a lot of stuff wrong with me. But when I leave, like I said, I hope people have a good laugh about some of the crazy things that I've done in my life. You know, like Porkchop Hill getting hired to fall on concertina wire. But why not? What the hell? Bless all of you. Whatever that means to you. Whatever your religion is, I don't care if you pray to a dead tree every night. I still bless you and think it's great. I think the world is going nuts. But, uh, I'm not the one to stop them. I wouldn't know how to begin to stop them. Whatever I did would probably make things worse. But boy, it sure is a mess out there. I'm glad I'm 86 and not 12. I don't know what young people are gonna do with this messed up world that we're gonna hand them. I guess they're scratching their head about it. Anyway, Y'all be cool till we, till we meet again. Till we meet again. Till we meet again. Why? Because you are so beautiful. God, if it wasn't for the audience, I don't think I'd have been born. I think I would have been stillborn if I didn't know there was an audience out there and a sidewalk where I could dance and people would throw money. That's how it started. I'm sure I've told you that before, but that's how it started. As soon as I could stand up, I started dancing and singing, and people started throwing money on the sidewalk. And I told you, the guy with the monkey, as soon as I had a crowd that gathered, he'd come over with the monkey, and the monkey would... Uh, the money that they threw at me, they started sort of giving it to the monkey. And he didn't have to dance, he didn't have to sing, he didn't have to do shit. I'll see you later.